All good. Thanks very much, everyone. Um, I think we might make a start. Uh, welcome to the City of Canning. My name's Patrick Hall. I'm the elected ma uh, mayor of the City of Canning. And it's a real pleasure to uh, welcome you all here to this evening. We'll start, of course, if you don't mind, and you shouldn't mind, uh, by acknowledging the Wadjuk people, the traditional custodians of the land upon which we all meet here today, uh, and to pay our respects, certainly my respects, to their elders, both past and present. Um, I just wanted to say that I know what you're going through. Uh, I had the unfortunate, uh, well, actually fortunate, um, uh, issue of having three elections in uh, the last six years. So I was elected and ran a campaign in 2015, uh, 2017, and also the mayoral campaign in 2019. So it's exhausting. It's an awful lot of work. It can become a little bit overwhelming, but I know what you've been through. Just for me, I uh, just wanted to uh, run through a few things. Uh, Stephen Kane to my right is the CEO of the City of Canning. Uh, welcome, folks. How are you? Just take a seat. Uh, and Stephen will be speaking to uh, you a little bit more about uh, the City of Canning and uh, the role of administration uh, and a number of functions in relation to a campaign. I wanted to talk to you just very generally about perhaps my expectations and the expectations of uh, councillors when they reach the City of Canning. Just a few general things from me. Um, no one knows, I guess, better than a councillor about probably the workload. Um, being a councillor really does take uh, commitment and it takes a genuine desire to get out and into your community. Uh, there are a lot of meetings, uh, not a huge amount of meetings, but quite a lot, uh, regularly, and mostly they're in the evenings. There's an awful lot of reading, uh, most of it and much of it uh, quite technical, and you'll be invited to attend an awful lot of events at schools, aged care centres, sporting clubs and community groups. It takes a fair amount of enthusiasm to be uh, a councillor and also takes a, an awful lot of dedication. You need to be a people person. If you don't like people, then this is probably not the vocation for you, because you're going to meet an awful lot of people. You'll need to enjoy meeting new people and especially making small talk with people you don't know, speaking publicly at times. You'll get used to that and you'll get better at it as you go along. And you need to be able to deal with people from all different walks of life, because you will deal with people from all different walks of life. You'll need to be resilient. The reason I say that is because despite the euphoria around your initial uh, campaign launch, not everybody's going to like you. Uh, this is a government, and for all intents and purposes, you will become a politician, even though I always say I'm not a politician. I've never been attached to any party or been a political candidate of any uh, persuasion, but uh, people will view you as a uh, politician. Um, and don't think that people can't be nasty, because they will. And we have got people that... Uh, uh, particularly nasty in this area, and that's um, uh, just a trait of local government. I think every local government has a few, and they spend their uh, time uh, dwelling on negativity uh, and personal attacks on councillors, uh, and we just have to uh, grin and bear it and rise above it. It's only a small part of what you do. Um, I choose to always be uh, positive uh, and think of all the wonderful things that actually happen on a council, because there are many. But anyway, you need to have a little bit of resilience. Uh, rewards. Being a councillor uh, is a leadership position, and it really is, in a community, but not only in a community. Statewide, councillors are recognised right across the sector, from, uh, from the top of uh, Western Australia to the bottom of it. You'll be a decision maker. So it's nice to be involved in big decisions about the community in which you live and the community that you really love. You'll be involved in really big decisions, and I think that's a wonderful thing. In your role, you'll be able to make genuine improvements to the lives of the people in your community, including your own family, of course, and your friends. You can assist local clubs and groups to prosper and to grow. And you'll also make an awful lot of friends along the way. Um, I go out, not regularly, but I go out regularly with people that I actually have met only through my role as a counsellor. And over a period of time, it's just natural, I think, that you become uh, friends and friendly with a lot of people in the community. And so I think it's a wonderful way to meet people if you're a people person. I want to talk a little bit about the differences in this community because depending on where you live in this community, you may be patently underwear that the city of Canning has uh, two di very diverse um, areas uh, split by the Canning River on one side, of course, uh, where I grew up in Shelley, uh, Rossmoyne, uh, Riverton, Williton across there. It's fairly leafy. Uh, people are very, very fortunate to live in those areas that can afford to live in there. On the other side of the city of Canning, in areas like uh, St uh, James, uh, Queen's Park, uh, Bentley, East Cannington, and through that whole district there, we need to acknowledge that we have very different um, uh, requirements in there. 
because people are really struggling at times. A lot of you may not know that this city has a soup kitchen just around the corner in Wharf Street, not a half a kilometre from where we sit tonight. We have people, I've got Judy Potter in the crowd here, we've got people feeding the poor and the needy in Bentley on a Wednesday evening from the Bentley Community Centre. So we have abject need in this community that a lot of the community doesn't see. I certainly didn't see it when I was a young fellow growing up in Shelley. But as the Mayor I've realised, and uh, councillors are at the back of the room here that are uh, ward representatives in that area, uh, know only too well the barriers that exist. So you'll be a mayor, uh, sorry, you'll be a councillor for all of Canning, and you will make decisions equally uh, on their uh, merits for all residents. And on phones, if my phone goes off in a minute, I've got a live interview on the ABC in, a, in about five minutes, so um, if they ring me, I apologise. So it's just uh, important for you to know that as a councillor, even though you'll be a ward councillor, you make decisions on behalf of the whole city. And so it's important to get on your bike or jump in your car, take a tour around places you haven't been before and really familiarise yourself with the whole of the city of Canning. It's a very big place. There's an awful lot of people live here. The attributes that I'd really hope that uh, candidates may have, I hope they have, because this is what um, I would require as a mayor, we really need people with integrity. We need people who will act ethically and honestly. We need councillors who are interested in their community, not in politics. We need teamwork and service to the community. That's fundamentally what this role is all about. Service to the community should be your sole aim if you are here tonight. Not self-interest with an eye to building a political career. That's not what it's about. It's all about service to the community. Above all else, service. Uh, that is on the city's crest. And that's the edict by which we live. And we have to, because that's our role. I'm a public servant and I serve this community. We need people from diverse backgrounds. I'm really pleased to see we've got many of those in the crowd tonight. We especially need more women on council. And we need you to have the courage to ask hard questions, but also the ability to l listen with an open mind to the answers. And most of all, we need people with common sense and with empathy. It's a real privilege uh, to be here this evening. It's a privilege to be uh, the mayor of the town, uh, the city of Canning, and to be an elected uh, mayor. And I very much look forward to the opportunity, perhaps, to work alongside some of you uh, post those elections in October, which are only a little while away, so we don't have terribly long. After what you hear tonight, a number of you may decide uh, that council may not be for you. That's perfectly fine. But I hope uh, that you go away from tonight with an awful lot of information and perhaps you might talk to others that you know in the community and um, perhaps urge them to also nominate as candidates. That's what makes this democracy in Australia so wonderful. Uh, so enjoy the rest of the evening. It's going to be an awful lot of uh, information. I'll see you all uh, at the end of it. Don't be frightened to, um, to actually uh, come up and say hello. And I just wanted to say we've got a number of serving councillors here. Some of them are actually uh, up for re-election this year, but I wanted to just identify them in the crowd um, only from the point of view that if you speak to them after this uh, occurs, they've also got some wonderful information about uh, serving on council. But Councillor Yasso Ponaturo in the front here, Yasso. Uh, Councillor Amanda Spencer Teo here. Good evening. We've got Councillor Graham Barry at the back. Thank you, Graham. I have um, Councillor Lindsay Holland uh, sitting beside him, who is from the Williton Ward. Any other councillors here? I don't think. No? But uh, thank you all. That's all I really wanted to say. Welcome. Enjoy the rest of the evening. And I really look forward to uh, seeing your campaigns as they unfold. Thanks so much. Well, as, uh, as Mayor Hall said, uh, my name's Stephen Kane. I'm the interim CEO of the City of Canning. Welcome tonight. It's wonderful to see so many faces in the audience and such a diverse group. Uh, tonight's presentation is designed to give you some understanding of the process that we're going to go through, your roles and responsibilities if you're elected to council, what's going to be required during the local government elections, and then the opportunity for you to ask questions. It's not intended to be death by PowerPoint. I hope it won't get there. But uh, we have two other speakers tonight. We have our, uh, from the West Australian uh, Local Government Association. Uh, um, sorry, three. Felicity Morris from the West Australian Local Government Association. Sybil Rogers and Lance Shrove from the Department of Local Government. And Zubin Ad... Now, Zubin, you have to forgive me. I may not be able to get your uh, surname pronounced uh, correctly. Ad Sahir 
uh, returning officer uh, with Ken McIntosh, if he's here tonight. A little bit about us. Uh, this is Canning's motto. One of the core functions of a local council is to set the strategies and policies for the local government. Every four years we go through and refine what is in the city's strategic community plan. The people who are on council now are doing just that. This process will go through and past the next election. If you're elected to council, you would be required to continue that process. So by December this year, we aim to have a framework for a new strategic community plan. Now, because this process goes throughout the election, I encourage you to look at the materials that will come into the public domain and get a sense of the priorities that the city, through its listening to its community, is saying that needs to be delivered for the next four years. Something to think about. The projects that are being delivered in Canning today weren't approved by Council last week or last year. They may have been approved by Council four years ago or further into the past. Projects approved in the next term and delivered on the ground, including the elevated railway at Cannington through to, uh, through to Victoria Park, aren't the product of a decision made yesterday. They are the product of an announcement made only a month ago, but the work behind that started years ago. That's going to be your job. If you're elected to council, you need to think about the projects and the needs of the community, not for today, but for the next 10 years and beyond. Our great city of Canning is broken up into four wards and there are 11, electors, uh, 11 elected members. Now, in each electoral cycle, every two years, half of our elected members are up for consideration. There will be a vacancy in each ward. We are a very fortunate local government. We're fortunate to have a wonderful collection of 16 suburbs, all with their unique challenges and their unique opportunities, and two significant industrial areas that help power a strategic part of the state's economy. And when you look through at our economic profile, if I told you now that Canning represents one third in the metro area, one third of the state's gross national product. Now, much of that's coming through the Welsh Pool and the Canning industrial areas. If you're elected to council, you're not elected just to represent the 91,000 residents who we believe were home on census nights. You haven't done your census, there's still time. <laughs> but you are here to represent all of the interests across the district, including the business interests. Our profile makes us unique. We say 50% there, it's actually 54% of our residents weren't born in Australia. Becoming a welcoming and thriving community means we need to recognise people from all different ethnicities and backgrounds, ages and religions. Your job will be to represent people who may come from a different diaspora to the one you belong to. But that's the joy of being a council and meeting new people. Here you are, Council Chambers. What's it going to be like? Well, firstly, you are going to have to care for the whole of the community. You may be elected to a ward, but you're repre you represent every citizen in Canning. You cannot look at the job through simply the prism of the street you live in, the suburb you live in, or perhaps where you went to school. You have to be able to see things from the perspective of all residents in our city. As the Mayor said, it's recommended that you're active. If you're not connected to community groups, it's very hard to take a touch point, a feeling for what's going on inside your community. Representation is what you're elected to do. As an elected member, there are significant responsibilities you will have. Tonight, Walga and the department representatives will go through the roles and responsibilities that, that sit in statute. There are laws that govern you, 
and there are laws that govern specifically elected members the types of behaviour we have to exhibit. The function of being on council is you're also running a large business. Now, I had a, 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 an extensive industri industry experience in private enterprise, some, some 10 years running businesses across Australia. But running a local government is running a big business, a $160 million budget. Most people, their household budgets won't be in excess of a million dollars. So imagine something that's 160 times more than that. Your responsibility is not to look at the needs, playgrounds and infrastructure today, but over the longer term. We don't expect you to have detailed financial knowledge, but you need to be able to learn. Each month, as part of our cycle, we present accounts and budgets and sheets of numbers to elected members. Don't worry if you don't understand them. One of the core functions of the administration is to have the expertise to advise elected members. There's nothing wrong with admitting you don't know something. There's a lot wrong with pretending you know something when you don't. A good friend of mine who's now in Parliament, in fact two of them were for my former councillors from the city of Coburn. One of them walked into my office very early this piece and said, Stephen, I just don't know what's going on. And we sat down and we worked through the issues because that's the function of the administration. I'm very pleased to say that not only is that man a member of the government, but he's a parliamentary secretary. He sits just below the ministerial level. You can learn. The old dog here learnt new tricks, and that certainly applies to everybody who comes to local government. There are a significant number of community events, citizenships, etc. You don't have to be at them all if you don't wish to, but do not come into this process and think it's a doddle. It will require a significant time commitment. There is reward at the other end. I said so the mayor's job's not up for consideration, so you'll have to cross that line out of uh, out of your household budget. But when you look at the salaries there for a councillor and for the deputy mayor, there is fair recompense for the amount of time you're expected to put into the job. So the uh, information and technology allowance is 3,500 for each uh, each elected member, and an elected member would uh, will take a salary of or a sitting allowance from just under 32,000. The position of deputy mayor is one that is elected by council. At the very first council meeting after election, the city will choose a deputy mayor for a two-year term. Um, as I mentioned, there is a significant amount of time you'll need to devote to reading and absorbing the material. It's like getting a small novel, or a big novel, depending on how extensive the work is, and having to devour that for book club every month. Now, anyone here in book club? You'll know what I'm talking about. You read quickly, you read and appreciate. But a lot of it has a lot of technical material in it. The roles of council are twofold. You will make quasi-legal decisions. That is, you'll make decisions on planning matters where you're expected to make a determination using the statutes and the legal responsibilities that relate to planning matters. But you'll also make discretionary decisions. There'll be decisions that'll come up within the remit of what council can do. Don't worry. If you're elected, we will explain all of this as part of a very comprehensive induction course. It does say at the bottom that the meeting times go from 30 minutes to five hours. Uh, the five hour mark, I'm told, is rare, but I have had one already at Canning and we had a four and a half hour meeting, I think, on Tuesday. The business of council is the business of council. Once the administration presents the matters for council, the deliberations take as long as they need, preferably before midnight. Now, if you are fortunate enough to be, uh, to be elected, you'll be sworn in virtually straight away. On the Monday after the council, uh, after the election, so the elections being on the 16th of October, there'll be a special council meeting. 
At that special council meeting, we will swear in the newly elected elected members and the returned elected members, those who have won their seats back. That meeting will also consider the election of the deputy mayor. It is also required under the Act to ratify the allowances that council will be recommending it pays for each of the roles. But that's about it on that night. That night's also a celebration, a chance to recognise with your family and friends that you, if you're successful, are now a member of the Canning City Council. Shortly after that, we'll go into another block of meetings where the extensive list of committees have to be filled. Every councillor is expected to put their hand up for at least one other committee. As the Mayor said, the business of being on council is extensive. If you thought you are going to come in here for one meeting once a month, or perhaps one meeting once a week, then I must disappoint you now. The governance and induction program will be specific to your level of understanding. If you are a returned councillor, we won't invest as much time in the induction with you because we'll expect there's a high degree of corporate knowledge. If you're newly elected, we will do this one to one. Now, you'll be told tonight about the programs you have to go through in order to be able to contest for being on council. You'll be told tonight about the programs you must complete as mandatory training if you're elected to council. I won't steal the thunder of these guests, otherwise they'll have little to talk about. So that's it. There's a lot to be said if you're elected to council. I wish you all very well for the process. Um, the starter's gun has already fired because there are steps the city had to enact uh, months ago to get ready for the, uh, the council elections. And I'll be here later on tonight to take any questions, so thank you. And our next speaker, and we'll be taking you through the election process and nominations uh, from the West Australian Electoral Commission. You have a presentation? Yes. Okay. Button left and right. I'll soon it's up on the screen. Evening everyone, I'm Zubin, I'm from the WA Electoral Commission. So what I'll be running you through today is just uh, a few of the rules, regulations, tips, hints, etc. for how you can successfully nominate to be on council and a few of the rules with regards to election material and things like that. So we'll get straight into it. So who is eligible to actually stand for council in WA? So obviously there's some simple ones, you have to be over the age of 18, you need to be an elector within the district, it doesn't matter which ward within the district you are, you just need to be an elector. Uh, now that means obviously you need to be an Australian citizen as well. So uh, you, now this is one that's already been touched on, this is very important here, must have completed the mandatory induction for prospective candidates course prior to meeting with the returning officer and lodging your candidacy. <coughs> So you have to go to the Department of Local Government's website, uh, complete this, obviously, course, and then grab the reference number that they give you at that point, and then give it to the returning officer to show us proof that you've obviously completed. That is mandatory. If you don't have that with you at the point of meeting with the returning officer, they will reject your nomination. Okay, and so you've got to go and complete it first. Next one, disqualification. Some common ones, obviously, you can't be a member of state parliament, for example, you can't be a member of another local government, you can't be an insolvent, uh, you can't be obviously a nominee of a body corporate, so if a, a corporation owns a property, for example, they can't um, nominate you to stand as a candidate at the election. You can have voting rights, which I'll talk about later on, but you can't stand as a candidate for that corporation. Candidate information USB, so we prepared. Um, as part of our little um, package for you, we've got some USBs. They've got the relevant forms, for example, the nomination form, the scrutiny form, should it go to election, um, some obviously fact sheets from the department which we've been handed, just a few hints and tips, etc., to obviously help you when you sort of fill out your nomination and decide whether it's for you or not. So, 
In terms of an effective nomination, what does it actually mean to have an effective nomination? Obviously, it's a requirement that you obviously fill out the nomination form, hand it to the returning officer. That can be electronically or it can be physically. You also need, as part of it, what will be attached to the ballot paper is a ballot paper profile. So it's just obviously a little bit of a spiel about yourself. What do you bring to council? What's your background? What skills may you possess? What are some of the key issues that are burning for you as to why you want to run for the City of Canning Council? That sort of stuff. The only change here is it used to be you had to have a maximum of 150 words for your profile. That's now been changed. So it's going to be 800 characters. That's the maximum you can go to. So that includes obviously numbers, letters, grammar, any spacing, etc. And I'll talk about our online nomination builder website. That will help you because that's got an automatic 800 character limit. So as soon as you hit that, it'll stop you and say, look, you've reached your limit. Do you want to tinker with your nomination prior to handing it to the returning officer or not? As well, you need to have your $80, that's the deposit fee, um, to actually run as a candidate. Uh, so that will obviously be deposited with the City of Canning. Should you be successful, you'll get that back, but I'll discuss that a little bit later on as well. Most important point here, all of these need to be handed to the returning officer, or at least shown to the returning officer, prior to the close of enrollments. So the close of enrollments for this election is going to be 4 p.m. on the 9th of September. As soon as it hits 401, that's it. It doesn't matter what the excuse is, the returning officer will just say, I'm sorry, I cannot accept your nomination, and that is it. Okay, so I would suggest a lot of people like to leave it for that last day or the second last day. If something happens, if there's a family emergency, etc., and you can't get to him, that's going to be a problem. So try and lodge your nomination with the returning officer as, as soon as possible when that 2nd of September, the opening of the noms, comes about. Okay, so as I mentioned before, this is our online nomination builder. It's very easy, very simple to use. It's from our website at elections.wa.gov. So what it does is it allows you to do all the pre-prep you want prior to actually meeting with the returning officer. So you can actually upload, um, obviously, your candidate profile. You can upload the picture and you can size it and you can grayscale it and do everything you want with it. Um, you can as well, it gives you a comparison, so it shows you what will appear on the notice board version, which is with all your fancy bold characters or any emojis you want or dot points, and then it'll give you a comparison of what will actually go out on the ballot paper, which is where we standardize everything. It's going to be a column inch like you'd see in the newspaper, black and white, that's it. Okay, it's the same for all candidates. It gives you a good little comparison to see how it actually appears and what the elector will actually see with regards to the content and the picture, how it appears. You can obviously go into that as many times as you want and keep editing the actual profile and the picture until you find that's perfect. It's, it's what I want. This one's key as well. As it was with the induction course, we will provide you with the reference number when you first log into the online nomination builder. Keep that with you because that's what you will need to get into the nomination builder each and every time. You can create your own password, obviously, that's for you to know and set, but that reference number is an automatically generated one. Keep it with you. You can even send it to the returning officer prior to meeting with him and just say, look, can you just check my profile? Can you check my picture? Can you make sure it's meeting all the criteria that I need to? He will be more than happy to. And he will then say, look, that's fine. You can then meet me on any time from the 2nd to the 9th at your meeting. So this is how it looks, obviously very simple. You go to our website, click on the link, it'll tell you that little green button, create the new nomination. It'll obviously create then a reference number for yourself, and then you go through the steps. It's only about three or four different screens, and it's very simple. At the end of it, you can obviously print it out, uh, have it ready for yourself, and you can see how it all looks. So on the profile, people will ask, well, what do I actually put in my profile? What do I send out to the electors of my ward and my district. So we try and keep it very simple. Obviously, I've mentioned that it has to be 800 characters or less. Um, but we try and tell people it's not about saying, look, I think the current council is useless and they've been raising rates and they've been doing this and they've been doing that and I, I'm here to sort of get rid of this councillor and, and that. That's not going to win you any votes with the electorate. They want to know what you bring to the position. Okay, what are your skills? Uh, what are your views on certain issues um, and what can you actually bring to enhance their lives within the city of Canyon? Okay, so it's biographical information, it's your policies and beliefs, 
Uh, it's not to be false and misleading. The only thing we say there, when it says false and misleading, it's not about what you say about someone else. It's about, obviously, are you going to be misleading people when they cast their votes? All right? Now, with regards to the photograph, it says there it's optional in terms of going with the profile on the ballot paper. But having had now nearly 10 years' experience at the Commission, I would tell you that the number of people who've been elected without an actual profile uh, on the ballot paper is very few, if, if any. So that would all, almost be mandatory for me. It's very simple. You can upload it, obviously, as I said, to the online nomination builder, resize it, see how it comes out, obviously, on the notice board and the ballot paper version, and then tinker with it as you require. Okay, so it'll be, as it says here, the profile will be put on the notice board, on the website, um, for people to have a look at, and with each election package, it'll go out, obviously, with the ballot paper. So that, and the one thing I would mention with this is, this is the best bit of free advertising you will ever get, okay? Because it goes out to every single elector within your ward. So every single person who wants to vote or is choosing to vote is going to read that profile. So that's the best way you can get to, through to them, even better than letterbox drops or things in the newspaper, etc. Now, so assuming you've met all these criteria, you know, you're uh, an elector within the district, you've met the returning officer, your profile is fine, you've submitted your money, you've got the, obviously, um, notice board profile there and then, they will say, fine, you're on the electoral roll, and you are entitled to a copy of the electoral roll once you're a successful nominee. So you will get one, what is called the residence roll, so that's for people who actually live within the district and the ward, and then you will get one copy of the owner occupier role. So that could be, for example, I'll use my example. I'm an, uh, on the residence role within the city of Joondalup. I live there, own a property there. I'm obviously automatically enrolled there. If, for example, I was leasing a business space somewhere here in the city of Canning, or I've got a second property here in the city of Canning, I can apply to the city of Canning. It's their role to be put on the owner occupier role. Okay, and therefore I have voting rights, and I've got. Uh, candidacy rights, if I want to stand as a candidate, as long as I mentioned before, you're not a nominee of a body corporate, as long as it's in your own name, or you're leasing it in your own name, not a corporation. And these are only to be used for electioneering purposes. It's not about, you know, getting the electoral roll and now I'm going to spam people with stuff after the election's finished. That's not what it's about. Okay. So assuming the ward you're contesting goes to election, that there's more candidates than there are vacancies, which is almost always the case, what we're aiming for is obviously we'll get all the ballot paper artwork to the returning officer. The returning officer will check it, say, yep, I'm happy enough with that. We will then send it off to our mailing house. They will do all the printing of the packages, printing of the ballot papers, uh, do all the insert insertion as well. Uh, and then we're aiming for, obviously, to be lodged with the Australia Post from Wednesday the 22nd onwards, okay? And the reason we say last weekend for effective campaigning 2nd to the 3rd of October is usually, based on historical evidence, about 50 to about 75% of people who are going to fill out that ballot paper, send it back to us, is usually within the first 7 to 10 days. So that's why that we say that is the, is the sort of last weekend for effective campaigning. Unlike with state and federal elections where you've got right up until election day, you can you know, hand out flyers all the way up to the big day itself, most people who you may be trying to reach with your particular views or trying to spook yourself will already have cast their ballots. So it's a waste if you put out a big, huge newspaper ad in the local community newspaper one week out from the election because three quarters of the people who you're trying to reach will already have cast their, their ballots. So that's why we say get in early, get in hard, you can even start doing it now. You can start putting out your election material now. The only thing we say is there's a couple of requirements which I'm going to go through, which is authorization requirements. And the thing we say is you're not a candidate until you meet with the returning officer and lodge all your required paperwork. Okay, so you can say, I intend to stand as a candidate for the upcoming elections, but you can't actually say I'm a candidate at the 2021 elections because that's not correct. Okay, that's not legally correct. Okay, so the return of the voting packages, assuming obviously Australia Post does a great job and gets all these packages out within a re decent rate of time, uh, we'll start getting them back into our central processing centre, um, which is going to be obviously in the CBD. We will have the daily returns per ward as well on our website, 
as I mentioned, typically 50% are returned within the five business days. So that just corroborates that. So as yourself, as a candidate, what can you do with these election packages? Obviously, when it comes to your own election package, fill it out, sign it, which I always tell people. If you're going to talk to anyone about their election package, make sure they sign it because usually we always get about 4 to 5%, which we have to automatically reject because they haven't actually signed the election package, which is very disappointing because they've taken all that effort to sign it, post it, return it to us, and then we just have to put the reject stamp on it and say, sorry, can't accept it. Important one here is um, do not take custody of anyone else's. If they say, look, can you, just, can you take my election package, drop it off at the city of Canning, or can you put it in the post office for me, just say, no, I can't. Sorry, it's under the rules, and we have had a couple of prosecutions this year as well of people who have done that, um, and they've had significant fines put against them. So I would suggest just don't take a chance, not worth it. The other one as well is you can't obviously fill out anyone else's uh, voting package as well. Uh, we aim obviously to get everyone who's on the raw uh, package, but some people move address, some people um, obviously there's a mistake for some reason with Australia Post, they haven't delivered it, whatever may be the case. You can actually get a replacement package from the city of Canning. All that means is that the barcode that is obviously individually targeted to an elector gets crossed off, gets electronically scanned off, and the new one is registered and therefore they can have another vote. But the old one is scanned off so they don't get two votes. Now, election day itself, um, and one thing I wanted to mention, sorry, as well with the election material, we get a lot of um, queries about social media because that's the new big thing, obviously, that's come out in the last couple of elections. What do I do with um, authorization, all that sort of stuff? Keep it very simple. We're not asking you to authorize every single post you put out on Facebook or Instagram or anything of the sort. As long as you put out that this is authorized by myself or someone else on my team on the front page of any sort of website, etc., that's fine. Then all the content that comes under that website is automatically authorized. Saves you a lot of trouble and it saves you a lot of complaints and a lot of argy-bargy that happens. Uh, but we do get a lot of complaints and people do and lodge official complaints which we then have to follow up with and contact you about. But fast forwarding, obviously, assuming everything's gone smoothly with the election packages going out, with all your election material going out, what happens on election day itself? Obviously, we can still accept packages and the returning officer can still accept packages all the way up to 6 p.m. because that's the cutoff um, for us. Nothing accepted after that, however. So once that happens, obviously, then we do the sort of the ballot papers per candidate and then we do the count, okay? You can have scrutineers present. You can have one person, one scrutineer per, obviously, candidate present for yourself, for your count. Uh, you could have more, but only one is allowed on the election floor itself. We obviously ask because the returning officer is going to be very busy on the day, and particularly as it gets closer to 6 p.m. itself. Could you please, if you're going to have a scrutineer, make sure you contact the returning officer well, well in advance, ideally well in advance of election day itself, fill out all the paperwork, they're more than happy to go through all the requirements with you and show you all the rules, etc. But try and give them enough time because they're going to be extremely stressed, particularly with a big, big city like Canning, where you've got f five wards and tens of thousands of votes coming back. So assume... Can I ask a question? Of course. Um, just in regards to social media, yep. I think, uh, could you share more like on that, like what, what is acceptable in terms of, I need to say, oh, I'll be running for of course you can. It's, it's like when I mentioned about the, you know, the candidate profile that you will be putting next to the ballot paper. It's like that. So it's essentially like that. Try and keep it to yourself. A little bit of biographical information about yourself. What's your background? Do you have any particular skills, finance, auditing, planning, etc., that you can bring to the role of council? Um, what are your views on certain issues that may be hot button issues within the city of Canning? Do you have any uh, plans or views that you want to enhance when you get on council, should you be lucky enough. You know, keep it, keep it sort of towards yourself and what you can sort of bring towards the role of councillor. It's not about, oh, well, I don't like these people or I don't like this policy and so I just want to say this, this and this, because that turns a lot of people off. Yeah. They really want to know about you as the candidate themselves. What are you actually going to bring to their lives and onto the council? Is that all right? Yeah. Cool. Not a problem. 
Okay, so hopefully the count obviously goes pretty smoothly. Given they're all single vacancies, it's going to be a manual count. So we obviously manually sort of count everything. That will take a few hours. Obviously, the returning officer will send the results off to um, the WAC. We'll confirm them, send it back to him, and just say, look, everything looks good. It all balances. He will then obviously make the declaration on the night and say, look, this person is one in, in this uh, ward, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. Uh, and once that happens, the results will be posted on our website sometime, to, some, sometime towards the end of the night. Uh, we try and temper people's expectations because, as you can imagine, we're doing 98 different local governments, and that equals more than 200 different elections. We have to check, recheck, and then confirm with the returning officer. So be a bit patient. Um, we'll get to it uh, within a reasonable level of time. Uh, as I mentioned before, with the $80 deposit fee, you automatically get it back if you're successful, so if you win candid your candidacy. And as well, the good thing is, as long as you receive at least 5% of the votes for your particular, in this case, ward, you automatically get it back anyway. So the odds of you not getting it back are very slim. It's usually only where it's a district election, like for example, the city of Gosnells, where there's maybe seven or eight vacancies and you've got 35 candidates. Someone's always going to miss out because the odds are they won't reach that 5% threshold. But with the city of Canning, it's, it would be quite rare. <coughs> Election materials. So I mentioned it a little bit before, um, but these are the specifics. There's, we get people ringing us up even in January, for example, in an election year saying, can I put out my election material? We always say, feel free to put out whatever you want as long as it meets the election uh, material criteria. So it has to have... Um, the name and address of the person authorizing it. Okay, it can be yourself as a candidate, can be someone else on your team, etc. The only stipulation we have is the address cannot be a pure box, but we realize there are privacy concerns, so you don't have to put your home address. You can put a work address, you can put a friend's address, you can put a family member's address. As long as we can contact you at that address and say, look, this particular election material needs to be either taken down or amended, etc., etc. It also needs to have the name and address of the printer. Okay, if it's, your, if it's yourself doing a print job in your study, that's fine. It can be, once again, you can have your name and address like you did with the authorization side of it. If it's in the newspaper, we say obviously you don't need to bother because we, then, we know the newspaper is obviously the person printing it. We get, this is probably um, the one area we get the most complaints on, election material, because some people are just not aware of the, of the requirements that there needs to be obviously always, every single thing you put out there needs to be authorised. Even on social media, as I mentioned, keep it simple. If you've got a specific web page, website that is dedicated to you running for council, just put on the top, on the front page, authorised by Joe Bloggs at whatever address, saves you a lot of time and hassle, and then every other bit of content underneath that is automatically covered. Okay, same thing with any letterbox drops, anything in the newspaper, et cetera, et cetera. If you're gonna put something out there, always authorize it. It just saves you a lot of time, effort, and hassle further down the line, okay? Because we do come back to you if we receive a complaint and say, look, this particular pamphlet, for example, in a letterbox drop has not been authorized. So we will come back to that person and say, look, you either have to get that back, which is very hard once it's gone out, but we then try and say, look, anything further needs to be obviously authorised, otherwise there will be prosecutions down the track. And with the electoral material, as I mentioned, as you, you sir, obviously asked the question, keep it about yourself. That's the one thing I would suggest. Just keep it about yourself and what you bring to council. That's very important because that is what electors actually want to know. They want to know a little bit about yourself and what skills uh, you bring to council what are your views? What are your passions even? You know, you've got a particular project you're very passionate about in Canning. Go for it, outline it, articulate it, get that message out there. People are usually interested. Electoral offenses. So what to be aware of? Obviously don't go out there sort of handing out $50 notes to anyone just as a tip. Uh, we've mentioned obviously the printing and publishing of unauthorized election material, very important. This one here, people get a bit confused with the deceptive material side of it. It's not about saying someone comes, because we get a lot of complaints saying, look, candidate B is, has called me unscrupulous, or they've said I'm a bad person. We can't do anything about that, unfortunately. That's not what that actual section of the Act relates to, because defamation has now been removed from the Act. 
If you feel you've been defamed by another candidate or a member of the public, you need to take that through the civic courts or the civil process, file a lawsuit and, and do whatever you can through the sort of legal proceedings. The returning officer doesn't have any power to obviously adjudicate that. We don't have any power to adjudicate that. All we'll be able to tell you is, as I've just mentioned here, take it through the civil courts. When it says misleading or deceptive material, it's talking about putting out any material that will affect the elector when they actually fill out their ballot paper. Okay? So for example, in the city of Canning, you know you've got just the single vacancies in all the wards. Okay? So if you then say, look, and as a result of the single vacancy, we just want a single tick marked against the person you actually want. Okay? Or it could be a one, or it could be anything that clearly marks who you actually want to cast your vote for. If you put out election material saying, if you vote 111 for candidate A, B, and C, and that's a valid vote, that's obviously deceptive and misleading because that's an invalid vote. So you're actually disenfranchising any number of electors who may think, oh, wow, this person who I intend to vote for has put this out. I better do that. Okay? So that's what we say. Do not put out anything that will affect someone when they actually mark their ballot paper. That doesn't mean you can't say, look, I'm... I'm against rate increases, that's not going to affect anyone when they sort of fill out their ballot paper. But if, you're, but if you're talking about things to do with how many vacancies there are in a ward, casting a vote for a particular candidate or a group of candidates, be careful in that sort of stuff. Now, canvassing in or near polling places, we've got the six metre rule. Okay, so you can't do any electioneering, you can't put any signs up six metres out from a polling place, which is obviously the city of Canning here itself. I've mentioned offences relating to postal votes. Do not take in possession of anyone else's postal vote. Do not mark anyone else's postal vote. You will get a 5,000 plus fine. We do prosecute, okay? Interference with electors, infringement of secrecy. All that means is there's a right for every elector to, have the, to cast their vote in secret and to have privacy, okay? So you can't be hovering as someone comes into the city of Canning for a replacement package, seeing who it is that's actually coming in terms of when the person's marked off the roll or in terms of inter interfering with them when they actually decide to actually cast their ballot and fill it out. Next one. Scrutineers, I mentioned before, you are entitled to have at least one scrutiny on the electoral, on the, sorry, on the count floor at any one time. Uh, the form itself is available on our website, of course, and in the USBs that um, Ken will have at the end of the night. Feel free to grab one. Uh, all you need to do is fill it out, have it signed, present it to Ken, make sure it's well in advance of 6 p.m. on the night itself because he's going to be swamped with a lot of work. Um, and it has all the rights of scrutineers, as in you can't touch ballot papers, only one person on the floor, uh, and that sort of stuff, and what you can challenge and that sort of thing. Disclosure of electoral gifts, we mentioned this, even though it's not our purview because we're not, we don't keep the gift register, that's from the city of Canning, they keep a record of the gift register. All we mention is that it's public and that any gifts you get above the threshold, which is $200, needs to be put on there. Okay, so make sure you keep an eye on what you're actually receiving from people, whether it's cash, whether it's, you know, donation of labor, whatever it is, and that needs to be provided to the city of Canning as soon as you get it, ideally. So as I mentioned, we've got Ken, if you just want to raise your hand. He's the man who you're going to be dealing with with regards to your nominations. He's more than happy to obviously answer any inquiries, whether it's through mobile, email, etc. Uh, he will be the one you will need to obviously contact to set up your appointment, lodge your nomination, etc., etc. Any queries, complaints, straight to him. If he can't obviously deal with it at some point, it'll be escalated to ourselves. We will then try and solve the problem as best we can and get back to you on that. The only caveat I would put on these contact details is Ken still needs to, as with all the other returning officers, have their training this weekend, where they will be issued with their WAC laptop and phone. But all the details will be on our website from Monday, and so therefore from Monday you can start booking your appointments or even just asking him general questions of if you've forgotten something I've mentioned here or you want to clarify something else, he's more than happy to take any of your phone calls and emails. Um, and he's available all the way through to, uh, obviously, election day itself. That's it from myself. If there are any questions, you're more than welcome to ask away.
With the printing material, mm-hmm. um, is it any particular? Is it formatting to anything like that? Is it can it be any size, weight, anything like that? It can be whatever In terms you like. Of, are you talking about your personal printing, or are you talking about what goes on the ballot paper profile? Uh, yeah, per- personal printing for, yeah, for, for the marketing side want, of things. You can take out a giant one-page ad in the West if you wanted to, do whatever you like, as yep. long as it's got the authorization and the, obviously, printing requirements yep. in terms of the name and address of the person, that's fine. Yeah, Not a problem. Cool. All right. So, um, obviously, you make declaration of whatever funds people give to you during the election. So, are there limitations in terms of what you can spend for your publicity, ads, and things like that? Yeah. As long as you declare everything that you're required to declare, that's fine. Whether you receive $300 at the end of your campaign or you receive 3000 it's irrelevant. Whether you spend all that money that you received or not, okay. at the end of the day, that's for the individual candidate to decide. But we've just got the requirements that you need to declare anything above the $200. That's all we're worried about. Okay, but from your post, for your, for your personal funds, are there limitations to what no, you can say? No, you can spend as much or as little as you want. Some people just do the $80 nomination fee, have the candidate profile, and that's their advertising. Okay. Okay? Other people, as I said, do the letterbox jobs, do the community newspapers, put stuff in the West. It's, it's up to the individual themselves. Okay. Cool. Yep, this person. Sorry. Just... If I decide to have a fundraising dinner, where I'll get the people who can donate a fair bit of my amount for my election campaign. Mm-hmm. Now, I wouldn't know who actually donated, like if somebody donated uh, a thousand bucks towards my, uh, towards my campaign. How would I actually just, uh, in the specific, as I said, in, in a dinner? Well, that's why I would say you need to be aware of who's actually donating to your campaign because that's quite a sizable amount of money, obviously, $1,000. Um, and so, therefore, that, that needs to be declared. Okay, and that needs to be put on, obviously, the, the, the donation register. So, you do whatever you need to, whether you have someone sign something um, to say, look, I am so-and-so and I have donated to your campaign, that's good enough as well. And then you can obviously register that with the city of Kenya. We always keep a track of who is donating what to you because there is a threshold and everything above that threshold of the $200 needs to be declared. Sure. Yep, just up the back. Thanks. Yeah, just uh, some clarification. I think you said earlier that, um, you know, if you wanted to put your um, posters out in January but you couldn't say you were a candidate, can you just... You can't say that you are a candidate for the election because until the nomination period starts and you've lodged your paperwork and your money, etc., with Ken, you're not an actual candidate. You can yeah. you can say very clearly, I intend to stand as a yeah. candidate. That's not a problem because you're just informing the electorate that, look, I'm going to be nominating in September for the October election. It's not a problem with that, but you can't actually say... I'm a candidate for the 2021 October elections because you're not. But by, the same, you're not. by the same token, if you leave the word candidate off a poster or a, you know, a bill that you're putting in a letterbox, then surely that would say the same as you're not a candidate. I mean, yes. if you're saying just vote for me in the council election of 16th, mm-hmm. that can go out any time as well. Is that correct? That could, as long as you don't say your vote for me is the candidate for the election, because you're not a candidate. You can say, look, I intend to nominate, All right. and then please, obviously, I would like to get your vote based on these issues, etc. So you, et you wouldn't be able to put vote on it? Uh, well, you could, but um, until people are aware of who the other candidates are, are they going to really be receptive to that? That's what you have to, you have to make a judgment call on that, whether you decide to add that into your sort of... Uh, election material or not. That's really up to the individual candidate themselves. It's always a little bit grey sometimes. <laughs> oh, another one, sorry. Just last one. Just, I just have a very simple question. Is this uh, councillor, what's the tenure of this councillor? Is it every it's year a, you have to run? It's run every two years. Oh, every two years. So you have a tenure of two years, years is it? Your council term is four years. Huh? Your four, four years. years. So if you're successful, you get to be on council for four years. Oh, oh that is attractive. <laughs>
Any other questions? Oh, yes, another one. Sure. Not a problem. Uh, Would it be the if you register for the event tonight, I did. if you um, send me at the end, then I can just make a note next to your email address and I can send that through to you by email. And as well, you can look, you can always even contact us at the W Electric Commission. Just say, look, I sat in on the canning information session, but I just wanted to get uh, a copy of the PowerPoint. We're more than happy, obviously, to send that across. There's, there's nothing hidden in here, it's all public knowledge. Okay? So if that's all the questions, I'll pass you on to the uh, next presenter. Standing for Council. What an exciting thing to do. Uh, we have Sybil Rogers along tonight to going to speak to us on that. Uh, just to address one, one matter. You need to know who has made gift declarations to you. When matters come back before Council, if someone has gifted money to your election and an item comes to Council and they have something to do with it, you need to be able to make the appropriate declaration of interest at that time. You just can't say, I didn't know they gave me $1,000 and along comes a development application that happened to have the same name on it. Okay? It is very important. All right. Let's stand for Council. Sybil? I just, Stephen, if I can just uh, have you for Steve. How do we uh, operate this? Yep. Two buttons, one left, one right, okay. one forward, one back. All right, so. That's it. Cool, thank you. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Sybil, Sybil Rogers, and um, this is Lance. Lance is uh, the Director at, of Investigations at uh, the Department of Local Government. Sybil, could you Sorry. talk to the mic? Oh, okay. Okay, sorry about that. So uh, we're from the Department of Local Government and Sport and, and, and um, Cultural Industries. And um, my name is Sybil Rogers, and that's uh, Lance Scrow. Lance is the director for investigations. Uh, how we'll do this presentation tonight is um, in two parts. I'll run through the first part with you, and Lance will take you through the second part. Um, I'll just tell you a little bit um, about myself. Uh, we've been asked to st stay on script, um, so I'm going to divert from it just uh, just now. Um, we are uh, <coughs> uh, being pulled in from different parts of the organisation. Uh, I'm not uh, generally a person that uh, would meet with an audience like this. Uh, I have a... Uh, at the moment, I'm doing local government grants, so I apologise in advance if... Uh, You'll see me reading from the script. It's um, just the task that I have at the moment. Um, but um, as you can see, it's, it's, um, uh, there is a lot of information to go through, so uh, I'll do the best I can. Um, I'll start with the first slide as we... Uh, let's go to the first slide. Um, so it says, what is uh, local government? And as you'll see... No, local government, as we all know, is the grassroots of, of uh, our three-tier system. It's a route that's uh, closest to the community. Uh, the local government is established by the state government to deliver services and facilities to communities. We typically refer to local governments as the pea catcher. So um, uh, only because um, uh, we would be uh, the local government, the government level that deals almost with everything. It's, uh, I'll give you a list, uh, a route run through this list. We've got local roads, footpaths, cycle paths, uh, waste management, parking, recreation facilities, libraries, childcare, town planning, land care, land care and coast care, domestic animal registration. I'm sure each and every one of you would be able to rattle off another dozen just like I have. So it's, it's, it's uh, by far Probably the most well uh, title I could think of it is, is as a pig catcher. We have um, we come to life through the power of the Local Government Act. Uh, it's 1995 Act. It's been amended a number of times. It's going through a, a current amendment now. Local government is comprised of an electing governing body from a minimum of five to a maximum of 15. Um, we have. Minister, current minister is Minister John Kerry, and I've been asked to read through the list that um, 
he's looking at. So it's Minister John Carey, he's the Minister for Local Government, and his current legislative themes uh, for reform, uh, reducing the red tape, current transparency, accountability, and so, sorry, greater transparency, greater accountability, greater simplicity, clearer roles and responsibilities, stronger financial reporting and traceability, and earlier intervention, streamlined resolution, stronger penalties. Some of these are left over from the time that Mr Templeman uh, was doing them, um, like early investigation. We never got to it then, but we're getting to it now. And as of the 1st of July, uh, currently, we have 137 local governments. Okay, on the next slide. Um, why stand for council? I'm probably the best people to answer that question, probably yourselves, but um, I'll read you through this list that I have. Govern the local government affairs. Um, if individual councils act together as a council too, govern the local government affairs, monitor the performance of local government functions, oversee the, the allocation of resources and determine the local government policies. Your role is likely to include, not in any particular order, representing the council, representing the community, providing leadership and guidance, facilit facilitating communication between community and council, making decisions on all matters before the council, uh, determining council policy, governing finances as part of the council, and planning and, planning and evaluation of council's progress. Um, going to the second. The roles and responsibilities of council. You, um, individual councillors act together as a council to... Oh, sorry. I just said that. Sorry, I should... I missed one. Yes, sorry, I have missed one. Why stand for council? Um, there are many reasons why people stand for council, and as I said, um, there's no one better qualified to, start to answer that question than yourselves. But it says, um, as I read, becoming a councillor is a big decision and there are many rewards. It is one of the, most, the best ways to influence change, whether short term uh, or long term. Uh, it, is, uh, it is important that local government mirrors the communities that they represent. And I have to say that um, I, this is my second um, um, uh, session, but my colleagues have been saying that uh, the one in the northern suburbs got only five odd um, candidates. The one last night I went to in the southern suburbs got another five. And I believe one in the western suburbs is seven. So by far, um, this is ten times that. So I, I can only... I'm very relieved to see so many people here tonight. Um, it, it only is a testament. Um, and a thank you to everyone here tonight. So uh, it goes on to say that um, nearly 17% of the Western Australians were born in non-English speaking countries. If we add the second generation of migrants, um, that figure is even higher. Uh, diversity is important. It enables a wide range of views to be heard, which can, be, which can bring about greater understanding of issues and better decisions. And as you know, councillors play a key role in community leadership and influence decisions. Uh, that can, that can make, be made for the benefit of everyone in the local community. Many councils also represent local governments on boards and committees. Being on council is a way you can make sure community perspectives are heard and considered. Succeeding in this role is, of course, balancing your responsibilities, obligations and, com and commitments. And as we've heard from the WAEC, those roles are um, by far very diverse and complex and as we've heard from Stephen, quite time consuming. Before nominating, it is compulsory to complete the department's online induction. The induction is free and should take approximately 30 minutes to complete. So, um, we've done that one, so I'll, I'll go to the values and characteristics of, uh, of councillors. As you can see, um, we read up there, it's the openness and transparency in decision making, tolerance and respect in all relationships, awareness of potential conflicts of interest, fairness in promoting community issues, consider diverse interests and needs, of, and needs across the community, 
and make decisions in the best interest of, dis of the district, observe principles of good governance and act with integrity. So when we add all those up, uh, the key points there to remember are accountability, um, ethics, promote and demonstrate the values of the council and exercise good governance, leadership, establish a clear, vision, uh, clear vision and direction for the community with clarity about roles and responsibilities, Transparency makes informed decisions to manage to manage risk and capacity, develop the capacity, the, the capacity, capability, and effectiveness of the local government. In another role that I did with the department, I was uh, a speech writer, and some of the speeches I most remember the speeches I've written for councillors after many long years of service, and we've had. Um, and when they would retire, we'd have um, the state government ministers turning, you know, going to their farewell events, as, as well as the president of the Walga and many others. Uh, I've never been a councillor, um, but I can only say that when I've written these speeches and learned about the lives of councillors, I, I only got the highest regard for them, the, just the, the makeup of that individual. I mean, I can name names, but I'm sure that you are across them as well. Um, it's just, for me, what falls to me the most is just the, the dedication, the time, the commitment, um, the hard yards that you'll put in, um, probably with um, little for it but your own determination to help out your council. So that's an enormous um, thank you for you in, uh, in advance. So we go to the next and the last slide that I look after is... Um, essential skills of a councillor. So as you can see there, I'll let you read them. I'll just see if I've got any notes to go with them. No, I don't. So, um, you can communicate, debate, participate in meetings, enhance discussion and assist discussion to reach closure. I think that's a key point. Um, you know, always look for the goal and go um, work towards that, be part of the solution. I'm coming off script a bit. Develop and maintain effective working relationships, manage interpersonal conflicts, exercise independent judgment. Um, so I think, and that summary, that comes to mind at the end of my uh, five pages, and I'll hand you over now to the director, Lance Thank you. Thank you. Hi, here you go. Cool, thanks. Um, how you doing? So, as Sybil said, my name's Lance Scrum. I'm one of the directors at the department, and uh, my area is investigations. Um, probably, if you're successful on the 16th of October, I'm not a face that you really want to see because it means you you haven't you haven't done the right thing by the act. The Local Government Act is a large document. Uh, I would encourage everybody to download it and read it. It's a really interesting read. But there's obviously we're talking about legislating, uh, we're the regulator, we regulate local government. The most important thing that we do though is we support. Uh, I, I'm, I, we've got a few things on the slides here to go through, but um, having sat in here a little bit, and I'm sure Walga will go through it a little bit later, we seem to be going over the same thing. So I, I just wanted to keep this one here, even though Sybil spoke to it. I've been doing this role for about two years. I came previously from the Department of Racing, Gaming and Liquor. From my experience so far, and I'm sure anybody that's uh, involved in local government would probably agree, the most important thing I see here is the third one along, develop and maintain effective working relationships. Your first aim you're going to develop, you're going to, you're going to be sitting with a group of people. It's really, really important to develop those relationships. It's even more important to maintain them. One of, the, one of the problems that I see and one of the problems the department sees and one of the challenges we have in supporting the sector is the fact that people can bring their own preconceived issues to, to, a, to an area. That, that doesn't help anybody. What your community is looking for is a cohesive group of people working for them, not working against each other. So if I could say from my point of view and, the, and, the, and some of the... The, the problems that I've seen, some of the challenges for the public, uh, for the sorry, public sector, we've got enough of that, mm -hmm. for the local government sector, is developing and maintaining effective working relationships. A commitment to the role. Um, I think that uh, everybody would understand that, it, 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 as I think the both uh, 
the mayor and um, Mr Kane said. This is not a this is not a five minute job. This is not a job that that is is a, a quick job. You really got to be committed to the role. Some of the things up there: attend all meetings, listen to, and consider the points. When we say that, there's a there's a great term, and I've got it written down here. It's degree disagree without being disagreeable. Robust discussion is what your people want. That's the reason why they'll vote you to represent them in the council. So be respectful and have that robust discussion. And there's nothing better, and I'm sure the mayor would agree with me, there's nothing better than having a bit of robust discussion and getting to the point. And everybody's had, you don't have a cup of tea afterwards. It's, uh, it's a little bit like, I, I always like, so it's a little bit like football. Leave it on the field and, and, leave, you know, and work together because it's really, really important. You've got to be committed to the role. Uh, it takes some time. So one of those, other than the Local Government Act, which is, uh, which is what governs most of the stuff we do, there are regulations, the most per important of them are the recently implemented Local Government Model of Conduct, Model Code of Conduct regulations, which is, again, just, just a real guideline of how, you, you, if you stick by uh, the Model Code of Conduct, you, you will have uh, four, eight, 15, 20 years, whatever you do, in local government and you won't come to anybody's attention and you will be a really productive member of your council, which is really, really important. Really important. Decisions you might make as a councillor. I mean, I'm not going to go through the obvious ones. It's, this is not about the particulars, about planning discussions or whatever. It's just a, a bit of an oversight. And you determine policy, you plan for the future, which is very important. And I know, I know the Mayor uh, spoke about that earlier. Managing assets. And Mr Kane spoke about that with the, you know, $160 million, I think the budget was what you said. $1.2 billion. Sorry, there we go. So it's, it's, it's a big job. It's not like running a, a corner delicatessen, which has got its own challenges, but it is a big job and it, and, and it really takes a fair bit of commitment. Okay, so... There's a clear delineation on this, and it's a delineation line there between the separation of powers. Uh, what you may or may not know is the council have one employee and one employee only, and the Canning Council, his, their employee is sitting over there, it's the CEO. Other than that, the CEO is the person who, on behalf of the council, on behalf of the community, put the right people in the right places to make the decisions of council get implemented. And that's as simple as it is. It's, it's no more difficult than that. Um, there's more information on the specific roles. So with regards to the role of a councillor, the role of a mayor, it's all in the, it's all in the um, Act. And I'd really, I don't want anybody taking notes or anything, but I really think that you should have a look at it. Sections, the start of the Act, 2.7, 2.8, 2.9, 2.10. They really set out, re <laughs> look, if anybody's ever read legislation, it can be quite dry, but it really sets it out. It's in black and white. This is what your role is as a councillor, and this is what your expectations are. And the people who are voting for you on the 16th will have those expectations on you. What to expect if you're elected? Well, obviously, as uh, Mr Cain said, you'll have your family there if you're lucky enough, and it'll be an exciting time for you. But we have some expectations on you at the department, as will the uh, council here. Probably the most uh, important of that is completing the universal training. So there are, uh, well, and I'm sure you will sorry, I'm, I'm not taking away your thunder. Okay. It, there, there are five units, and it, I'll, I'll read them out to you, and you can tell me whether or not you think you would find these to be useful. Understanding local government. Serving on council. Meeting procedures. Conflicts of interest, which can get you into trouble, and understanding of financial reports and budgets. They're the count, that, that, that's, the, uh, that's the courses we expect to be ta undertaken in the first 12 months, and by, by virtue of their actual title, you can see how, how fundamental they are for you to fulfil your role. Right, there's a heap of stuff on here, and I'm not too sure whether uh, you'll get a copy of this. Um, the support, there's heaps of support on our website. There's heaps of advice on our website. Um, the one thing that I would, I would encourage you to do, though, is... Oh, sorry. Oh, it's gone. Um, 
Our phone number is 65527300. We have a hotline, LG hotline, at dlgsc.wa.gov.au. Ring the department. If you are having a thought about what you need to do in your campaign, any queries, first, first point of call can be the council. I'm, if I'm speaking out of turn there, I apologise. Um, otherwise, give us a ring. We have people like Sybil, we have a lot of people who are just there to give you a hand and let you know exactly what you need to do to be a good and competent member of your local council. So I'll leave you with that and the fact that um, I wish everybody who chooses all the best of luck on the 16th of October. And as I said, as the Director of Investigations, I hope we don't ever meet again. Thank you. <laughs>
well, downloading and reading the whole act may be ambitious, but it's useful if you can, um, if you're comfortable referring to it as you need to. But um, the act states that the role of the council is to govern the local government's affairs. Um, and you would have heard these sort of phrases being used throughout the evening. We like to say the council, um, to draw on the, the, anal the analogy of running a business, the council is board-like, so it's strategic, it's the big picture, governing the affairs of the local government, allocating resources, um, ensuring there's an appropriate structure for the local government, and also, as we've heard, employing and managing the employment of the sole employee of the council, which is your CEO. Again, we've heard these um, the aspects of these of the role at various points through the evening. Um, at this point, I would like to highlight the um, point D, which is participates in the decision making process. And it's important to emphasise that individual <coughs> councillors don't have decision making authority. So your effectiveness in achieving outcomes really does work on your teamwork your ability to work with and to influence your fellow councillors in um, collective decision-making processes at formal council meetings. So, uh, the mayor, oh, sorry. So in addition to the role of councillor, the mayor has some additional civic and ceremonial functions. They speak on behalf of the local government and they also have a liaison role with the CEO. So, the mayor and the CEO are a really important nexus between the two halves of the local government, the council and the administration. So that's where the two halves come together. The role of the CEO is a, is a significant and a complex one uh, and are separate from but complementary to the role of the council. So the CEO is responsible for the day-to-day -day management of the local government uh, for the employment and management of all other local government employees. The CEO is responsible for ensuring that council's decisions are implemented um, and also for advising council. So when you have questions, you can go to the CEO and the CEO and other officers will answer those questions for you and ensure that you have all the information that you need to make the informed um, decisions for the benefit of the community. So, um, as we've seen, the local government as a whole is made up of the two complementary bodies, the council led by the mayor and the administration led by the CEO. They perform separate but complementary functions, with council as the strategic decision maker that plans for the needs of the community now and in the future, uh, allocates financial resources, and ensures the structure of the organisation is capable of delivering the strategic direction. And that decision-making function happens at formally convened meetings of council, where all elected members participate in that robust and respectful debate um, that results in the making of legally binding decisions. The administration, led by the CEO, provides the advice that informs those decisions gives effect to the decisions and carries out the day-to-day -day business of the local government. And although these functions are separate, it's absolutely crucial to the functioning of the local government that the two components are able to work collaboratively together. So having looked at the Act, uh, let's see what it may look like or apply it to actually fulfilling the role. So the first component of the role is representing the interests of your community. And as we've heard, it's not simply the people within your ward. You'll be um, tasked with representing the city of Canning as a whole. One of the first things that you'll do once, if you are successfully elected, is uh, to sign the declaration of office. And that's your promise to the community that you will represent and serve them, that you'll be putting their interests first and um, that that will dictate the way in which you fulfil your role as a councillor. 
And of course, the notion of acting in the best interest of your community does raise the question of dealing with situations where your personal interests are affected. We have heard about dealing with conflicts of interest a couple of times this evening. It is um, something that you will receive training on if you're successfully elected. But it's important to know that there are specific statutory requirements for the disclosure and management of conflicts of interest. Uh, and if you find yourself with a matter coming before council in which you have a financial interest, you will be required to disclose that interest and you will be prevented from participating in any debate, decision making or handling of that matter. I've used the term financial interest quite broadly there um, to refer to a range of interests that are defined under the Act. Again, you'll receive further training on those, but it's important to understand that it's not just limited to situations where a decision could result in you receiving a direct financial benefit or um, detriment. There's a broad range of circumstances that might result in you needing to declare a, a financial interest and exclude yourself from participation. So it is just important to keep in mind, particularly if you have complex financial affairs, how that may affect your role as a councillor. On the other hand, uh, the other category of interest is impartiality interest. So that relates to where a decision may involve someone with whom you have a personal relationship, a family member, a friend, a teammate. In that situation, you are still required to disclose an interest, but you can participate in decision making and debate on the matter. And that reflects the expectation that you'll be able to set aside your personal interests and continue to fulfil your role in the interests of your community. Leadership and guidance. The strategic community plan was again mentioned earlier in the evening and that is um, the most significant uh, guiding document that each local government is required to prepare. And of course, a significant part of leadership is looking to the future and planning for the future. So I, I would echo um, the encouragement to engage with the process that's underway at the moment, because that will be an important part of your role as a councillor moving forward. Communication. Obviously, um, in terms of your connection with your community and ongoing engagement with your community, your role of facilitating that communication between community and the local government will take many forms. There will sometimes be some structures and protocols around that. The slide is an, is an example and the administration will assist you in understanding what your responsibilities are when you're undertaking that role. And finally, decision making, uh, which as we've heard, is, is arguably the most important role that you will play as a councillor. It's where you will actually get to have a say in the decisions that make a significant impact on your community. Um, it occurs at regular formal meetings of council and committee meetings. And um, you got a glimpse at the meeting schedule earlier this evening. I'd emphasise that the effectiveness of your participation will depend on your preparation. So again, as you've heard, several times through the course of the evening. It won't just be the time that's taken to turn up and attend that meeting. There'll be significant amount of time invested in reading and understanding the agenda, in um, preparing and asking questions to clarify anything that needs further, in further information. And that can be either directly through the administration or the city um, does have informal meetings, which also allows you to ask for that clarification. But then also you'll need to prepare for the meeting itself. So consider the kinds of points that you might make in debate um, and prepare, as we've heard, for that robust uh, contest of ideas that should happen in a council meeting. Um, keeping in mind that it should, of course, always be respectful. So if you haven't already engaged with some of the agendas, I would encourage you to have a look at the agenda for maybe the last couple of council meetings so that you get a sense of the kind of information and the quantity of information that you'll need to be engaging with on a regular basis. The CEO also fulfills an important um, function at meetings. 
uh, providing advice to the meeting, um, both during the meeting, but also largely in the form of the agenda. And I'm gonna... So just to, I think I'll, I'll largely wrap up on this, which is the model code of conduct, which we again have heard about. Um, new regulations were introduced in February which have introduced a mandatory code of conduct that apply to council members, committee members and candidates. So that means that once you've had your meeting with the returning officer and lodged your nomination, you are a candidate and the provisions of the code of conduct will apply to your behaviour. The regulations were introduced um, due to some concern around the behaviour of some candidates, but as we've also heard, the Code of Conduct can be an aspirational document as well. It's not just about what you can't do, it's about the principles that should inform your behaviour as a candidate. Uh, and I have been told you will have a copy of, of the Code of Conduct in your materials this evening. So these are some of the behavioural provisions that apply to candidates. As you can see, there are some that are relevant to some of the questions that have come up or the discussion that's come up through the course of the evening. So what can you put in your uh, election materials? Uh, so under the Code of Conduct, your, your communication, including your use of social media, must comply with the code. And you can only publish factually correct material. You also have to ensure that your um, interpersonal relationships, the way that you treat other people, as well as your behaviour at council or committee meetings, if you're attending, um, complies with the requirements. And finally, the rules of conduct, um, which deal with more serious matters. There is only one rule of conduct that will apply to you while you're a candidate, and that deals with your relationship with local government employees. Um, if you are successfully elected, then all of the rules of conduct will apply to you. And again, I'd encourage you to familiarise yourself with the, the code of conduct as a whole. For those councillors who are um, contesting re-election, obviously in your current role as, as councillors, the whole of the code of conduct applies to you, even though uh, you have a dual status as council member and candidate. And finally, again, as you've already heard this evening, you will need to complete your mandatory induction uh, and make a note of the reference number because that needs to be quoted on your nomination form. If you're successfully elected, you will need to complete those five modules of compulsory training within the first 12 months after your election. And that's all I have. Are there any questions? So, as a council member, so do council, sorry, thank you for that. So, do council members also have normal day to day jobs or do they do it full time? Uh -huh. Probably the best people to answer that are the, the council members in the audience. I think the experience of being a council member is a very diverse one and people take different approaches. But, um, would anyone else know? Sorry, I have not answered your question. <laughs> the answer is it's, it is possible to work full time and be a council member, yes. Um, okay. You need to make the decision about the impact that that may have on your very limited free time okay. um, and the impact that, may ha you, that may have on your family, caring or other responsibilities. Okay. Um, some council members are lucky enough to have, have, have fewer uh, or not be working full time, but it's it's a question of achieving the right balance for you, I suppose. Yeah, that's a good answer. Thank you. <laughs> um, so, in the in the event where you need to go overseas or interstate, um, and you've obviously made these commitments for the, those certain Tuesdays, I think it was for each week. Um, where, where, does, where, do you, where does it sit with that um, to, you know, give heads up or to do a Zoom or, or something like that? Um, yeah. Yeah. 
Uh, very interesting question. So there are arrangements that allow you to apply for a leave of absence if you are unable to attend council meetings. And it's important that you do that because if you fail to attend three council meetings without a leave of absence, you'll be disqualified. Oh, yeah. Okay. But um, as long as you have a leave of absence, that's fine. Um, the Local Government Act has somewhat come into the 21st century recently to deal with COVID. Yeah. And there are limited circumstances in which you can attend a meeting electronically, but they're limited and you will need to seek approval. Oh, I could imagine so. it would be a pain having, having a computer <laughs> in the, the room. Yeah. I, I think we local governments have been able to make it work really well. But um, yes, as long as you are aware in advance of, of what your commitments are, then you should be able to make the appropriate arrangements. Yeah. Look, we have got to the end, but just to give you an idea of the time constraints and the conflicts you're going to face, uh, today's my mother's 85th birthday and my son's 32nd birthday, and I'm not at either celebration. And at the night of the elections, it's my daughter's 22nd birthday, and I won't be at her birthday party either because my job is to be here. There are a lot, a lot of things you've heard tonight. There is a lot which will be uh, new, and there's some things you won't have fully digested yet. We've got a gift pack for you. We've got a gift pack at the end with a thumb drive with some materials on it. All you've got to do is ask for it on the way out. The presenters will be staying for a brief short, uh, period of time. If there are other questions you've got, please feel free to ask them now. It is a decision that you have to make. You know, the starter's gun is already fired, but the counter TCs will open, I think, on the 2nd of September. And that's the date by which you have to really have made the decision in your mind, is this for you? How many of you have thought this is a fairly long presentation tonight? Because if you have thought it's a long presentation, based on the average of two and a half hours for canning meetings, you've still got another 20 minutes to go. And that's before we give you dinner. All right. Thank you for taking the time. I wish you all the very, very best. Uh, there are plenty of people to answer questions for you. And good luck. <laughs>